Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, I want you to take your Bibles, uh, your apps, whatever you read on, uh, and turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 is where we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible with you, we've got some Bibles under some of the seats. Uh, Feel free to grab one of those. If you don't have a Bible at home, grab that Bible from out from under the seat Put it under your arm and walk out the door after the service with that Bible because we want every person in this room to have a Bible at home. We want you to be able to read your Bible at your house. We want you to hear a message here at Calvary and then go home and double check your word and make sure that what we said from this stage is biblical and accurate. So please feel free to take that Bible home. Now before I get started... um, because I'm the pastor on stage today and uh, I have a microphone and you don't, I get to tell you something that happened last night that was very exciting for me. I got to baptize my six-year-old son Knox last night uh, in the service. It was an amazing opportunity in my life. And, you know, as a dad, there are many proud moments, but as a follower of Jesus Christ, There's no prouder moment than knowing that your son is going to go spend eternity in heaven with his Savior. And that was, I posted some, uh, people posted videos and pictures. I shared a couple of them so you can go to my Facebook page if you want to look at some of that stuff. But uh, it was awesome. (laughs) It was so cool. So now to the message. Um, A few years ago after moving to Havasu, Um, I I was the youth pastor here at Calvary, and uh, it was summertime, so we took our students out on the lake. We had a bunch of people volunteer their boats, and uh, we took them out on the lake. We were out all day. It was a great time. Towards the end of the day, one of the students goes, hey, why don't we go jump off the cliffs? And I was like, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. I've heard stories about this stuff. I've been wanting to do it. I'm a thrill seeker, so going and jumping off of a cliff, riding a roller coaster, uh, bungee jump, that's my thing. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. This sounds fun. So we pull into the cove with our boats. And of course, when you pull into the cove, it kind of opens up and you see the cliffs. Uh, If you've ever been out there. If you've never been out there, you come into this cove and there's these cliffs. It's actually one outcrop of rock and it has two levels to it. Um, It's got a, a one level that's probably 20 feet high and another one that's like 35, 40 feet high, maybe something like that. Uh, you guys who have been out there more than me maybe know that it's different. Anyways, it di- as we pulled in, it didn't seem like it was that tall. You know, nothing bigger than the super high dive in a big pool or something, uh, you know, an Olympic pool. And so we pull in and I'm watching people as we pull in jump off of this cliff and I'm going, wow, this is awesome. This is going to be so much fun. Uh, and so we pull in, we anchor the boats, the kids are jumping off the boat, and they're like, Chad, come on, let's go. And I was like, yeah, phew, jump in, swim over. And the whole time I'm swimming, people are jumping off, and I'm watching these guys jump. And it was, I was getting really excited about this. And we get to the little place where you kind of get out of the water, and you start climbing your way up. And uh, I'm climbing, and I'm watching these kids jump off. And uh, I was just getting really revved up. This was my thing. I was like, yes, this is going to be so awesome. And uh, one of our kids passed the, the first level and went up to the highest level. And I kid you not, I'm not exaggerating. If you teenagers, uh, young adults that were with us that summer, you re- may remember this. One of our kids climbed to the very top, like 40 feet high, jumps off and does like front flips off of this high dive down into the water. And I'm watching all of this. I'm going, whoa, this is so cool. This is going to be so much fun. And so... There's like five kids in front of me, five te- teenagers in front of me. And so one of them jumps off, and I'm watching, and he comes up out of the water going, yeah, this is great. And next one jumps, two in front of me, and then another one jumps, and then the last one jumps, and I get up to the edge, and I went, <gasps> The 20 feet turned into 200 feet in that much time. And suddenly this fear overtook me. I was like, I don't want to die. I like my life. I have a wife and a son at home. I have responsibilities. People depend on me. I enjoy living. God, don't let me die. And I went through this moment, and guys, we've all been through this moment where I had a struggle of trust. Do I trust the fear that has suddenly overtaken me, or do I trust what I know? Because I had seen 
at least a dozen and a half students jump off this cliff just in the short amount of time I was there. And I kid you not, every single one of them came up not dead. <laughs> I knew that it was okay. I knew that I would survive. You know, they even had all their limbs when they came up out of the water. So I knew that it wasn't life-threatening. I knew that I wasn't going to permanently injure myself, probably. Um, but I had that struggle of, do I trust what I know? I know jumping off of a 20-foot cliff into deep water is going to be just fine, and I'm going to survive, and everything's going to be great, and I'm going to really enjoy it. I know that. Or do I trust the fear that in the moment, because of just one look down to the water, had overtaken me? What do I trust? Haven't we all come to a place where we've had that struggle of trust? I'm not talking about jumping off a cliff. I'm talking about trusting what you know or trusting fear or trusting something that may not be true. We all have those struggles of trust, don't we? We do. It's part of human life. It's part of what we battle. It's part of our struggle is to figure out where to place our trust. And today's passage addresses that. It, it addresses trust where we put our trust and what we lean on, what we know. And so I want you to look in your Bibles. I want you to look at Matthew eight, or Luke 18, sorry, Luke 18. And we're going to start in verse 9. This is Jesus talking. He's going to tell us a parable, and this is what it says. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Now stop there. I know you OCD people are going nuts because I didn't finish the parable. I'll come back. Stop there for a second. Imagine the arrogance of this jerk. And I'll call it out. I'm not afraid to say what he is because Jesus makes it clear that this is not a good person. Jesus makes it abundantly clear that this person is not who we should model our lives after. Imagine the arrogance of this man standing before God and going, God, thank you for creating me because this world needed me. I am the stuff. I am the man. Look at how amazing I am. That's what this guy's doing. Before God, this man is showing off how amazing he is. And not only is he showing off, he is judging others in the midst of it. God, I thank you that I am better than everybody else in this room. That's what he's doing. That's why I say this guy is an arrogant jerk. I'm a pastor, and I am no better than any of you in this room. I'm a sinner, just like everybody else on the face of this planet. I am not a superhero. I'm not a spiritual superstar. I'm a sinner in need of God's grace, but this guy doesn't get it. So let's keep reading. You OCD people back on the passage. It says, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his, home ju his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Doesn't get much clearer than that, does it? Stark contrast. You've got the prideful guy, the Pharisee, the spiritual leader, and you've got the humble guy, the guy who understands is standing before God. And it's pretty extreme, right? You've got the guy that's really prideful, really full of himself, really thinks himself pretty up and up. And then you've got the guy that won't even look up into heaven, won't look up toward God because he's so regretful and so ashamed of his sin. Pretty stark contrast. 
Now let me just call this out. What we're talking about today, this parable is about our trust issue. This parable is about our trust issue. We've all got trust issues, don't we? We don't trust people. We don't trust particular types of people. Some of us in this room don't fully trust God. Because maybe we've been through a difficult time. Maybe we've struggled somewhere. Maybe we're blaming God. We all have trust issues. But this parable addresses that trust issue. Where are we placing our trust? That's the big question this morning. Where are we placing our trust? Who or what are you trusting to save you? To get you into heaven? So here's my first question that I think we need to answer this morning. Do you trust in you? Do you trust in you? That's what the Pharisee did, right? The Pharisee trusted in himself. He trusted in what he had done to save him, to get him into heaven. Because what does he say? Thank you, God, that I'm not like these other losers. Thank you, God, that I'm a righteous guy, and I do everything right, and I give from everything, and I fast all the time, and I do everything you told me to do. He's trusting in what he does to get him, get him to heaven. And let me just clarify something here. He wasn't wrong. His heart was wrong. He was focused on the wrong aspect of his faith. He had it out of order. Because let me just be blunt here. Our works, what we do, when I say our works, works is a Bible word for the things that we do. Our works, the things we do, don't get us to heaven. It's the biggest misconception in our culture today. Well, if I'm a good person, then I'll go to heaven. Oh, yeah, I'm totally going to heaven because I'm a good guy. You know, I don't cheat people, and uh, I don't cuss, and uh, I've never punched a child, so I'm a good guy, so I'm going to heaven. That's not truth. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible is black and white clear that you could never be good enough to get yourself into heaven. Here's the fact. Every single one of us in this room have sinned this morning. And it's, we've only been awake a few hours. We are all, every single one of us, we are all sinners in need of the grace of God. That's a fact. That's who we are. That's how we're made. And so we have to get this perspective right. You want some proof on this? Two passages out of probably five million passages. Not, not literally, there's not five million passages in the Bible. But out of dozens and dozens of passages, here's two that in very black and white terms makes it clear that our works, what we do, can never save us. And here's the first one, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says this. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works. Your faith is what gets you into heaven. Your works mean diddly squat to God. It's your faith that gets you to heaven. Again, don't get me wrong. Your works are important, and I'm going to come back to that. But when it comes to salvation, when it comes to getting into heaven, your works mean nothing. Your relationship with Christ is the only thing that matters. You want more biblical proof? Here's another one. Titus 3, 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says this. He, Jesus, saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. You could never work, you could never give enough away to get yourself into heaven. You are not good enough. I am not good enough to get myself into heaven. Period. That is not up for debate. So do you trust in you? Or are you like the tax collector? Do you trust in him? Do you trust in you or do you trust in him? And I say him with a capital H. Him is in God, as in Jesus, the Trinity. 
The tax collector trusted in God's grace and mercy. He understood his place before God. Because let's face it, if you are not a believer in Christ, here's what this means. Some 2,000 years ago, God sent his only son to this earth as a person. He was 100% God and 100% human. You go, that doesn't make sense. I'm sorry, in the spiritual world it does. And he came and he lived a perfect, sinless life. Completely perfect. Did not sin one time. We have all sinned in this room today. And Jesus went an entire lifetime without sinning. And at the end of Jesus' life, he was betrayed and he was hung on a cross. And the Bible says that the forgiveness of sins comes through the covering of blood, the shedding of blood. And it was through his blood, the perfect, ultimate, all-time sacrifice, that your sins and my sins are covered. And he only asks that we step into a life-changing relationship with him in order to receive that forgiveness. That's what gets us into heaven. There's nothing else on the face of the planet that you can that can get you into heaven. You can't bribe God. You can't influence God through what you do. It is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Period. End of story. And if you've got questions about that, come talk to us afterwards. I would love our pastors, our leaders, our deacons, our ministers would love to talk to you about what a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ looks like. So come talk to us. We want you to trust in him, not in you. That's the point. So, the tax collector understood this. He got this part. He understood that he needed God's mercy because he was a sinner. Now, let me be really blunt here. If you have fallen asleep, wake up! Because I'm about to make a statement that I want everyone to hear. If you have not heard anything, and you're not going to hear anything else of this message this morning, if you had a late night last night and you're struggling to stay awake right now, that's fine. You're not going to offend me. But hear this sentence. I want every person to be able to walk out of this room understanding this concept that I'm about to tell you. And here it is. God is more concerned about our response to sin than he is about the sin itself. God is infinitely more concerned about how you respond when you sin than he is about the sin you committed in the first place. Let me put it in perspective for you for a moment. God is all-knowing. He knows every move you're going to make before you make it. He knows exactly what's going to happen from now to the end of your life. Every moment, every little thing. He knows what socks you're going to pick 10 days from now. He knows everything. So do you think that he knows you're going to sin? Yeah, he does. Because he knows everything. Not only does he know, he expects. He knows. He's looking at it knowing that we are going to be tempted and we are going to fall and we are going to sin. It's who we are. Sin came into the world through Adam and Eve and messed us all up. Thank you very much. But the fact is God knows you're going to sin. Is he concerned about something he knows you're going to do or how you're going to correct it and fix it after you've done it? Think about your own children. When your child messes up or when your child messed up, Were you more concerned about the exact moment they did something wrong, or were you more concerned about them learning from that mistake and not doing it again? A good parent is more concerned about them learning and not making that same mistake again. That's the idea here. God is infinitely more concerned about how we respond to our sin than he is about the sin itself. And so how are we supposed to respond? How, what's the response that God wants from us? I'm going to give you three responses this morning. And this is what the Bible says God wants us to do. The first one is recognize. God wants us to recognize our sin. 
When we mess up, God wants us to recognize it. He wants us to be aware of it. Now, I understand that there's some of you in this room, and it's not a big deal. It's a learning curve. Some of you in this room have no idea what God's expectations are of you. So let me back up for a second. I say recognize your sin, but what is sin? I've used that big churchy word quite a bit this morning. What does sin mean? When I say God doesn't want you to sin or he wants to, you to learn from your sin and, and respond correctly, what does sin actually mean? The Bible gives us two definitions of sin. Sin happens in two ways in our lives. The first one is direct disobedience to God's desires, God's will, God's commands in our life. So that's like reading the Ten Commandments and then going and lying to someone after you've read the Ten Commandments. That is God giving you a command not to lie and then you going and lying. That's disobedience. The second form that sin comes in, and this is found in the book of James, that is knowing the good that you should do and not doing it. So recognizing that there's some good thing that you could do somewhere and going, you know what, I just don't want to put the effort forth and you just don't do it. Those two things are what sin is. That's what the Bible tells us. So, see your sin. And if you need help understanding, again, learning curve, some of you in this room don't even know what God's commands are. And that's fine. It's not a big deal. Maybe you're a new believer. Maybe you're not a believer yet, but you're curious about Christ and you're interested in maybe getting to know him and you want to know what the expectations are. Let me give you a passage that gives the list of the do's and the don'ts. Pretty concise, pretty easy to read, pretty easy to understand. If you're curious what God's commands are, go to Galatians 5 and read verses 19 through 23. Galatians 5, 19 through 23. And here's what you're going to find there. There's a list of works of the flesh. Those are sins. And those sins are listed out just... And this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and don't do this, and this, and this. And it just gives a list. Pretty easy. And then he goes on to say, but instead, do this and be this kind of person. And in verses 22 and 23 of Galatians 5, he lists the fruit of the Spirit. Be people of love, of joy, of peace, patience, on and on and on. Because having a relationship with Christ is not following a rule book. It's not about understanding every rule and doing uh, what you have to do to be obedient. It's about changing who you are as a person. And so even if you just learned the last part, the fruit of the Spirit, you'd be an amazing follower of Christ. And so recognize the sin that you have in your life. That's step one. That's the first way to respond. The second way to respond is to repent. Repent. I know, another big churchy word. I'll define it here in just a second. Repent. And repent simply means this. Repentance is when we see our sin and we're regretful about our sin and we do what it takes to not do that again. Okay? So let me give you a physical illustration of this. Let's say this is my sin. It's shiny, has a pretty display. I can move it. I can play games on it. It's a great sin. I enjoy this sin. I spend time around this sin. I, I'm not touching it, but I'm going to spend time around it. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to smile at it. You're a pretty sin. And if I do that, there's going to come a point where I'm going to embrace that sin. I'm going to live in that sin. Go read James chapter 1. It lays this out about how sin works in our lives. We get tempted And our own temptation in our heart, if we don't do something about it, leads us to do this, to grab our sin and embrace it and live in the sin. And I'm going to live in my sin. I love my sin. My sin's good. It feels really well. It feels nice. It's comforting. And then there's going to come a point, if I'm a follower of Christ, there's going to come a point where I'm going to realize, I'm in sin. Whoa! I don't need to do that. That's bad for me. It may feel good in the moment, but long term, that's going to destroy me. Spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, that right there, that sin, that's going to destroy my life. So 
Repentance is going, you know what? That's my sin, and rather than walking around it and smiling at it and doing this with it, I'm going to do this. I'm going to walk this way, and I'm going to do everything I can to avoid that sin. That's repentance. That's what repentance means, is to see our temptations, see the sins that we struggle with, and do what we can out of the regret for that sin in our hearts, do what we can to avoid that sin. You with me so far? That's repentance. That's the second response that God wants us to make. He wants us to recognize the sin, and he wants us to repent of the sin. The third one is he wants us to remove the sin. He wants us to remove the sin. He wants us to stop living in it. Now let me address this like I would my six-year-old son. And I'm going to call out some sins, and I'm going to give you what I would tell my son. Six-year-old, remember, not 26, six. Six Six-year-old boy. Are you currently, or are you being tempted to sleep with someone who is not your spouse? Six year response to a six year old, stop it! That's not what God wants for you, so stop it! God commands us, go read Galatians 5 again. He tells us that sexual immorality, that means anything sexual outside of the marriage relationship, is a sin. Are you sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Stop it! That's a sin. Ooh what i would tell my six-year-old does that work here yeah maybe that's not god's best for us that's not god's desire for us to live in that because ultimately it leads to destruction go read the sociological studies do you know that if you cohabitate with someone you're 60 percent more likely to get a divorce but you don't hear that in culture but it is a psychological and sociological fact Stop it. What about this one? Are you or do you plan on cheating someone or cheating on your taxes so that you can put a little more money in your bank account? Stop it! That's not what you're supposed to do. God doesn't want you to cheat people or cheat the government. Well, it's the government. I didn't vote for that person. I don't care! Go read Romans 13. Paul was talking to the Roman people. He was talking about an emperor that he personally despised because that emperor threw him in prison and was persecuting the people that he loved. And yet he still tells the people, go pay your taxes to that guy because that's your job as a citizen. So pay your taxes. Don't cheat the government. Don't cheat other people. Stop it. It's not God's best for you. And you're ultimately not going to win. That's going to come back. You will reap what you sow. What about this one? Are you an angry or a hateful or a jealous person? Do you struggle with being angry all the time? Stop it! Again, six-year-old, stop it! That's not God's best for you. Go read the end of 1 Thessalonians. It says, be joyful always. Don't live in jealousy Don't live in anger. Don't live in hatred. Don't live, if you are that political person that gets angry at all that stuff, stop reading all those posts and articles. We're called to be a people of joy, not of debate and anger and argument and all that junk. Be joyful. Stop being so hateful and angry all the time and avoid the things that make you angry. Politics stinks. Deal with it. If you get all riled up every time you read about politics, stop reading politics already. Jeez, it's not that hard. It's not rocket science, people. Let me try another one. And this is an interesting one. Are you opposing and gathering people to you to oppose your church, whether it's this church or another church or whatever? Did you know that's a sin? Go read Galatians 5. It talks about factions and dissensions. That specifically means that if you've got a problem with your church, you go take care of that with the leadership and you stop bad-mouthing the church to other people. Period. End of story. Stop it! That's what the Bible says. That's not God's best for you. 
Go read the book of 1 John where it says over and over and over again, if we can't love each other as a church and we're creating dissensions and getting people all riled up to be against our church for some stupid issue, if that's the people we're going to be, no one will want what we have. So stop. Stop doing that. If you've got a problem with Calvary Baptist Church or any other church that you attend, go to the leadership and get it taken care of. Do it the biblical way, not the gossipy, unrighteous way, sinful way. Here's another one. Let's go to the Ten Commandments. Do you lie on a regular basis? Do you struggle with lying, telling the little white lies, exaggerating your story? It was this, it was this big. Is that you? Stop! Again, six-year-old mentality. Stop! That's not what God wants for you. Those lies catch up to you. You realize that, right? What you reap, you will sow. So stop lying. Here's a tough one. Do you have a tendency to talk about people behind their back? Stop! That's not what God wants for you. I'm trying to make this funny. It's not, but it's, I'm trying here. The fact is, is God doesn't want us to talk bad about other people behind their back. It's gossip, it's rumors, it's lies, it's evil. If you have that, if you struggle with that, stop. That's not what God wants. Here's a hard one for Havasu. Do you get drunk? Stop! God doesn't want you to get drunk. Again, go read Galatians 5. God doesn't want that. And why does he not want us? Because we make bad decisions when we get drunk. So stop. Make good decisions. Make sober decisions. If you struggle with drinking, we got a great program on Monday nights at 6.30 called Celebrate Recovery. Come join us. Guys, God wants us to not sin. He wants us to respond in a good way to our sin. Take steps to remove the sin from your life. Do whatever it takes to do that. Get help. If, I know that some of the things I mentioned just now are not as easy as just saying, oh, I'm going to stop. Some of those are real, habitual, addiction issues. Things you've done for decades. I get that. I understand that. Guys, we have pastors. We have ministers. We have deacons. We have leaders. We have godly people we have counselors in this church that would love to sit down with you and talk about getting out of these sins about stopping these sins again it's about responding about doing something to stop you from sinning anymore talk to someone that is godly that you trust to keep you accountable to check up on you so that when you do sin they can help you not do it again prevent yourself from having access to your temptations let's go to that first one are you sleeping with someone who's not your spouse if you're doing that stop spending time with that person good night it's not that hard the fact is, is God doesn't want us destroying our relationships by sleeping with any person that, we come, that comes in and out of our lives. He wants us to live righteously and in a pure way. So put up roadblocks. Put up walls between you and your temptation so that you cannot access that temptation anymore. Do something about your sin. Stop going, oh, I sinned, oh well. It happens. I'm a sinful human, and not do anything about it. Prevent yourself from sinning. Take steps to not do that anymore. Romans 13, 14 says this, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh. In other words, remove the temptations from your life. Make your sin inaccessible. Make your temptations unattainable. Take the steps to do that. Live out the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22, 23. Live those out. Memorize them. And every time that you're not doing what the fruit of the Spirit says to do, then 
re retrack yourself. Get back on track. We're called to respond to our sin. God wants us to respond in a godly way so that we don't fall into our sin again. Because Jesus Christ died to redeem your sin, to redeem your life. He took your sin, cleared it out, and cleaned it up. And he wants to redeem your life. He wants you. Romans 15, at the very end, Romans 15, 57. He wants you to have victory in your life. He wants you to have victory over your sin. So understand that the response is the key. You trust God, knowing your place, respond to your sin in a godly way, and do your best to remove the access to that sin that you can. Join me in prayer.